My name is Mark. Um, I'm one of the pastors here, in case you're wondering who this weird guy is at the front. We've been going through the Gospel of John recently, and we wrapped up chapter one last week. It was a long chapter, 51 verses. But we ended off uh, learning about the first disciples that Jesus called to himself. And today we're going to kick off chapter two of John. And we'll be going through the first 12 verses of John chapter 2, which takes us through the wedding at Cana in Galilee. And uh, in these verses, the Apostle John records the very first miracle that Jesus does in his ministry here on earth. And you might wonder um, what that has to do with the video that we showed, but this video actually uh, very closely ties in with this passage that we have today. And it, it, uh, it just fits so nicely with the law that Jesus or that God gave the Old Testament uh, Jewish people and into the New Covenant today. And so we're going to go into that today. And, and uh, the, John, he records this miracle for a very specific and intentional purpose. And that's so that we're going to really believe in Jesus Christ. And, and he specifically gives us that reason in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, almost at the end of the book. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but they are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now, John clarifies that there's so many other things that Jesus did, but I wrote these specific miracles down, he's saying, so that you will believe that Jesus Christ is God and that you're going to have life in his name. So this miracle that we're going to go through today, this miracle of turning water into wine at a wedding, it was the first recorded miracle of Jesus. And at first glance, it it does seem like um, this was almost maybe a practice miracle, if you wish. It doesn't seem like it would have been really important, um, like maybe healing someone who can't walk or making a blind man see or raising someone from the dead. Um, Those seem like important things. Uh, Making wine because you ran out of wine seems a little unimportant or insignificant, if you ask me. It's, it seems like kind of, I don't know, kind of like if you ran out of milk at home for cereal and you had to go get more milk, and instead of going to get more milk, you just prayed and asked for a miracle, and God provided you a jug of milk in your fridge. You know, it just seems so insignificant. Um, but this was actually a very significant miracle when we dig into it, and I hope that we see that today. I hope that we get to see Jesus Christ and his greatness today through this miracle. Um, there's a lot of things in this miracle that I can't get into this morning and that I can't dig into and show you guys just because there's not enough time. There's a lot packed into these 12 verses. But what, I, what we'll do is we'll watch the scripture video um, On the screen behind me, if you have a Bible, you can follow along in your Bible or or on your phone, on your Bible app. And then we'll dig into the purpose of turning water into wine at a wedding. The Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and the disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Let's just pray together before we dig into these verses. Jesus, you are the God of miracles, and 
Today, as we go through this miracle that you performed at a wedding, I pray that it just gives us this clear picture of you and that it draws us into you so that we would love you more than we've ever loved you before. I pray for a deeper love for you, God. I pray for this, this church, this group of people, Grace Fellowship in Worman here, that we together would love you just more and more. And I pray that you would grant us a love for you that motivates us to share this good news of the gospel with all the people around us. And this morning, I have a fear that I'm going to fail in showing your glory and your power this morning. But we know that your word is powerful, and so I pray that it would speak to those who are listening today. And I pray that you would be with anyone who hears these words and who hears the words that you've written in your book. And I pray that you would just use those words to impact these all of us with your glory and your power Lord, I pray that we won't fall victim to the complacency that's all around us where life is just good enough and we get the feeling that we don't really need you. We have everything we need. Very often we just want from you, we just want the get out of hell free card instead of actually loving you. So Lord, help us to love you when times are good and when times are bad, when we struggle. When we struggle to know where to turn, I pray that we would rest in your power and in your love and in your grace and mercy. pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to start off today, uh, we, we just heard the verses, so I'm going to start off today just clarifying some of the cultural context surrounding this miracle, just because I think it'll clear up a few of the questions that we have before we really d- even dig into this miracle. This miracle, on the surface, like I said, it does kind of seem insignificant. Like, does it really matter if you run out of wine at a wedding? Is that the end of the world? Was it really a big enough deal that required a miracle? It would seem as though it is, if we look at Jewish history. To us, it it seems insignificant when we read it. But when we dig into Jewish history, we find that it actually was something that was somewhat urgent. Um, You know, for us, it might seem like it's just kind of a little bit of an embarrassment, like if you run out of hamburgers at a barbecue or something. But that's not the case in Jewish culture. It was really important to them. When we read of of the culture back during the times of Jesus, we find that the context was very important for this wedding or this miracle that happened. This feast, this celebration for a wedding, often it would, it would last for days or even a week back then. It wasn't just a one-day deal. And it meant food and drink every day, all day for everybody. So if a family were to run out of food or wine for the celebration, it was a huge dishonor to that family. The groom's family was, was the family that would host this feast or this celebra- celebration. And, and so if they would run out of food or wine, it was a big dishonor. But not only that, it gets really interesting. There was actually a provision in the law that the, that the host family could potentially be levied with a fine for running out of food or wine or be threatened with legal action by the guests who were shortchanged on their feasting. This sounds strange. This, is a little, this was actually a big deal to them. They took their parties seriously. And and I don't think that comes out in the writing of John here because he would have assumed that everyone reading these words would have known that this was a big deal. You don't run out of wine at a wedding. That's a problem. It was completely unacceptable in the culture of the day, dishonorable. And because the wedding feast could last for days or as long as a week even, I guess we can understand and see why they might run out of wine. It would be hard to guess how much you're going to drink for a whole week for hundreds of people. But anyway, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she must have sort of known the host family well. She finds out that they're going to run out of wine on the third day, and this was not good. And so she goes to Jesus, and she asks him for a favor. Let's read verses 1 to 3 of John chapter 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, after just giving you the context of the Jewish weddings there, I can hear a little bit more of panic in her voice. Jesus, they have no wine. She's stressing out. It was kind of a desperate plea for for some people that she knew. She didn't want their family to to be dishonored or even suffer financial loss or or a lawsuit. And so Jesus responds to her in verse 4. Jesus says to her, woman... What does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I feel like I have to just clarify just one thing before we move into this phrase. When Jesus calls his mother a woman, he's not using it in a derogatory way. 
or as a derogatory term for his mother, as it might sound when we read this through the lenses of our culture today and the way our culture uses the words. If I say to my wife, woman, I need some coffee. I mean, you guys would be like, what kind of a jerk are you, right? <laughs> You're an idiot. But that's not what Jesus was doing. Even, even in the, we can find a little later in John chapter 19, verses 26, when Jesus speaks to his mother from the cross, he uses the same words. John chapter 19, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. This was a term of endearment. Jesus loved his mother and she knew it. But anyways, now that we get the fact that out of the way that Jesus was not being disrespectful to his mother, he was being firm with his mother. He was saying, my time hasn't yet come, but he wasn't being disrespectful. And so Mary, she just looks at him and she, she tells the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. She just has full faith in Jesus. He's going to do this. And, and, and she tells the servants to just obey. And in verse 5, and then in verse 6, we see now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now, Mary just tells these servants, you do whatever Jesus tells you. And that'll be good enough for her. She totally has faith in Jesus that he's going to take care of this major problem that they're having at this wedding. So in verse 6, there's these six water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. And there's a couple of very interesting and very significant things about these stone water jars. The first thing, although really not the most important thing, was their size. I don't know if you noticed that. A keg is about 16 gallons. So John tells us these stone water jars are roughly 20 to 30 gallons. And there were six of them, okay? So that's somewhere between 8 and 12 kegs of wine. That's a lot of wine. And they were already on the third day of feasting. So how much more wine did they need? A lot, apparently. But the thing that's more important about these stone jars is that they had been used, or they were used, for the Jewish rites of purification. That was their purpose. So everyone would have dipped their hands in the jars. They would have washed their hands according to Jewish customs so they would be ceremonially clean. And I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we read Jesus' instructions to the servants in verses 7 and 8. Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they fill them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. So these servants, they filled the jars with fresh water right to the top. They drew out the water, and it turned into wine. And they brought it to the master of the feast. The master of the feast would kind of been like, a, say, a master of ceremonies that you would have at a modern-day wedding. And, and I love... This guy's response after he tasted the wine, verse 9 and 10, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he says to him, everyone serves the good wine first, but, and, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. You see, the master of the feast knew that you use up the good wine at the beginning of the feast. That way, when everyone gets a little bit drunk, You use up the bad wine, they don't notice. The guests can't tell the difference. The master of the feast probably didn't understand, why did you save this really good wine, the best wine, the amazing wine, for the end of the feast? It made no sense to him. You see, there's something very profound in this statement that the master of the feast makes. He says this, everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine but you have kept the good wine until now. You see, that statement, it kind of hit me over the head. You see, the groom didn't serve the poor wine first like the master of the feast might have thought after he tasted this wine. Nobody does that. He would have served the good wine, the good stuff first, until the people can't tell the difference. Then you serve the bad stuff. Who cares then? They're already plastered. They can't tell. Their senses are dull. So he served his best wine first until he ran out. And then Jesus comes and he makes the best wine that the master of the feast had ever tasted out of stone jars of water. No wineskins, which would have been the traditional way of storing wine. No grapes, no fermenting process over time. No other ingredients, just water. And it made the groom's good wine seem like poor wine even though it was good wine. It was a foreshadowing of the new agreement or the new covenant that God would make with his people here on earth. The significance of this miracle was huge. 
You see, the original agreement or covenant that they talked about on the video earlier that, G- that God had with the Jewish people or the Israel- Israelite people before the time of Jesus Christ was a good covenant or a good agreement, you could say. It was for the Jewish people. They were chosen by God as his special people. They had rules that they were supposed to follow as his chosen people so the nations around them would see how good God is and the way they lived their lives. It was good for them. They were chosen by God for no other reason than God chose them to be part of his people, his family, his nation. But he had rules that they were to follow. And part of that symbolized, is symbolized in these stone water jars that Jesus used to make the wine. They were for the ceremonial cleansing of the hands. But the people, the Jewish people, couldn't hold up their part of the bargain. They broke his rules, his laws, they sinned, they turned their backs on God. So God allowed animals to be sacrificed to pay for the sin of the people. And the people would have to continually sacrifice animals to pay for their sin, to cleanse themselves of impurities. And they would do ceremonial washing to cleanse themselves of impurities with water from these stone jars. And this sounds actually like a terrible agreement if we think about it now. Man, that'd be a lot of work. Hey, you got to sacrifice animals so often. you got to ceremonially wash your hands every time you go here or go there. Um, it sounds kind of bad when we think about it from looking from here back. But it was actually really good. The alternative it was, would be that you pay for your own sin. You would have to die for your own sin. So an animal taking your place is actually a really good thing. They would have been really thankful. This was a good agreement. Just like the good wine at the beginning of the wedding, it seemed really good when they were, when they were in it. But God decided to give his people a new covenant And so God sent his son, Jesus Christ, here to earth to make a new agreement or a new promise to his people. It would seem so much better than the covenant that God had previously made with his chosen nation. The previous covenant or agreement or promise was really good, but it was going to seem really poor after this new one comes along. It would seem like nothing compared to this new agreement, new covenant that God would have with his people. The miracle of turning water into wine is amazing, but I think we miss the point if we can't see that in everything. Including in this miracle, Jesus is showing us that God's new promise of salvation to mankind through Jesus Christ is way better than the old. When Jesus comes to the wedding party, he makes much better wine than the good wine. It's amazing. And it must have been way better for the master of the feast to notice that it was better after three days of drinking. And when Jesus came to earth and he died for us, he made a new and better covenant for us. No longer did we have to sacrifice animals for our sins as the Jewish people had to do in the old agreement or the old covenant to pay the price for our sins. As good as God was in allowing animals to be sacrificed for our sinfulness, instead of making us take the punishment for ourselves like we deserved, Jesus came and he made it way better, infinitely better. He was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He died so now we don't have to. He rose to defeat death, something that the Old Testament sacrifices could never do. The Old Testament law could never do. They had to be repeated over and over by the people to continually pay for their sin. Jesus was a perfect sacrifice once and for all. He is better, just like when he came to the wedding and he put the good wine to shame by his amazing wine. The sad part is, is that most people can't see that Jesus is better. When Jesus did the miracle at the wedding and he changed the water into wine, there were a few chosen people who would see what Jesus Christ had done. Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably knew what he had done because she had asked for the wine. So she, we assume she probably knew that he had done a miracle to produce this wine. His disciples knew what happened. They were there with him shortly after they had been called by him. So probably about five or six of them that would have been there with him. We know that the servants who drew the water knew the miracle had happened. They were there when this all went down. But the rest of the people would not have been able to see the amazing miracle that just happened. In fact, the majority never even knew what was going on. There were those who, like the master of the feast, Um, could understand that there's some really good wine at the feast, but they had no idea where it came from. And instead of knowing that Jesus had done this amazing miracle, 
the master of the feast, he just gives credit to the groom and his family. He's like, why did you say this amazing wine till now? Well, the groom had no idea what Jesus had done. And then there were those who were too intoxicated to probably even notice that there was this amazing wine. Their senses would have been dulled. They wouldn't have understood at all that there was something really good going on. It's the same today. We live in a community of material blessing beyond what anyone could have imagined even 100 years ago. It's a gift that God's bestowed on our community. Just like the entire wedding feast benefited when Jesus shows up, the entire community benefits when he's given us this common grace that we just don't deserve. Jesus has blessed us beyond what we could imagine, and most of us are too intoxicated with selfishness and pride, individualism to even notice. We'll never see the gifts that God's given us. We're too full of self. And just like at the wedding, 90% of the people will never see that this better life is from Jesus because we're too intoxicated with the goodness of the life that we have here today. There are those who do realize how good we do have it, and they know something's up, and they can't believe their good fortune, but they don't know where it comes from, and really it doesn't matter to them. Life is good, and they give credit to themselves for their hard work, and they give credit to the others around them for helping them achieve certain status, certain wealth, certain lifestyle, just like the master of the feast did. He thanked the groom. He's like, man, this wine is awesome. I can't believe how great it is. Thank you so much. Give credit to the wrong place. And there are those who see Jesus Christ today in, in everything, just as Mary, the disciples, and the servants would have at the wedding. There are those who, who see the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made and they understand that this new agreement that Jesus has made with his people is really, really good and amazing. They understand the miracle it took to save us from our sin. The sin that wants to take over our lives. When Jesus came to the wedding party, the party got a whole lot better all because of him. Most of the party goers never knew that. But I'm praying that today you will know that when Jesus came to earth and made his new covenant with his people, he made life a whole lot better. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 50, Jesus even tells us that the unbelief by most people is predicted to happen and that people would experience God's grace and they wouldn't understand it and they wouldn't get it. Verse 14 and 15 of Matthew chapter 13, indeed in in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never under understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's heart, people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed, lest they, sh- lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Now, these people in, in, in this verse here in Matthew were intoxicated with other things. Isaiah predicted it. Jesus reminds the disciples that people will hear and experience things that God does and and will reveal who Jesus is, but they won't get it. Even the ancient prophet Isaiah predicted that. They're not going to get it. It was the same as the wedding feast. The people tasted the new wine, but they're too drunk to realize how good it is. Their senses had grown very dull. They could not taste the difference in the wine because they didn't know. They didn't even know they had a problem. They probably never knew that they were about to run out of wine. The master of the feast had no idea because he just assumed that the groom had brought this really new, amazing wine. They continued their feasting, their good life, totally oblivious to the glory of God that had just been manifested like right where they were. That sounds like warming today. I don't know. We're so intoxicated with our good life. We're living with all the things we could want, and our senses are dull to the miracle of what Jesus Christ has done for us and the significance that it holds for us. When Jesus came to the earth, the whole world benefited from his offer of salvation to us, but not nearly the whole world sees it or understands it. And unfortunately, they're just not going to believe something that they can't see and they can't understand. When we truly understand what Jesus has done for us, we will understand that Jesus is so much better. He's better than anything here on this earth. And he's better than the old covenant agreement that God had with his people. 
God had a good covenant with his people in the Old Testament where, where he allowed sacrificial payment for, sin, for the sins of man and animals. That was really good. So the people didn't have to die for their own sin. Just like the good wine at the beginning of the wedding. But he gave us so much better agreement now or better covenant in Jesus Christ when he came to take away sins of the world. I want to show you what happens when we truly understand Jesus and what he's done for us. In verse 11 of our text today, John chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. There was a very specific reason that Jesus did this miracle at the wedding. Never mind the foreshadowing of his new covenant or the promise that Jesus was about to make with mankind, that Jesus was about to take away the sins of the world. He did this miracle in front of his disciples, his first miracle. They saw it, and they believed in him. You see, the disciples could see the glory of Jesus through this seemingly small and insignificant miracle. Because even a small miracle of making more wine is infinitely more glorious than we as humans can comprehend. He had called these disciples to himself just probably just a few days earlier. And they followed him. But after seeing this, God's glory manifest here on earth in a miracle, they truly believed in him. They got to see a piece of his glory here on this earth. And they believed in him. Not all the people at the feast believed in him, only the ones who saw Jesus and the miracle he performed. When we see the glory of Jesus today, and it manifests itself here on this earth, we cannot help but believe in him. As insignificant of a miracle that turning water into wine might seem on the surface, it had significant and important purpose. John recorded seven signs or seven miracles of Jesus during his ministry in this book of John that he wrote. And this was the first one. And after this miracle, the disciples truly believed him. John goes further near the end of his book. I want to read this again. I read these verses at the beginning. John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. I want to read them again at the end. I want to kind of bookend with these verses. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The reason that John wrote this miracle down was so that we could have life in Jesus' name. John wrote this book to tell people about Jesus and all of his glory, his miracles, his love, and his death and his resurrection. It's also we can get to see Jesus for who he really is. He was God, he was man, and he was perfect. Jesus was willing to give up everything for us, and I mean everything, so that we could have the best grace and mercy that are not deserved by us. But 90% of the world is oblivious to what Jesus has done for us, this miracle of his sacrifice on the cross. And when, we say, and when we say we would give up everything for something, it really doesn't mean much, because compared to Jesus, we don't have much to give up. He had his perfection, his righteousness, purity, glory. He gave it all up on the cross to take the punishment, and all the sin came upon him, the punishment for you and I. He came in and made this earth infinitely better. He came and made the wedding better. And most of the wedding didn't notice. He came and made this world better, and most in the world don't notice. If we see him in it all, in his glorious presence, we will do the same as the disciples did when they saw him turn the water into wine. We're going to truly believe in him. And one day Jesus will take his bride, the church, and we'll have this great wedding feast that will go on into eternity, the perfect wedding feast with Jesus as the groom. This will be a feast for the ages. You can read about it in Revelations chapter 19, but we're not going to go there today, sorry. But this wasn't the purpose of John's book. But when we see Jesus, when we believe in him, and we see the purpose of Jesus' miracle, that we would believe in him. It is Jesus who made our lives new and infinitely better in him. It's him that deserves the credit for the change in our life, lives. So let's offer our lives as living sacrifices to him today, as our act of worship to him, not out of a sense of duty, but just pure worship. 
so that we too can be at this amazing wedding feast one day with Jesus Christ. Let's just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to see you clearly in this world today. The impact that your death and resurrection has had on our lives is undeniable, but so many people cannot see it. I pray that as you reveal yourselves to us more clearly, as the good King and Savior that you are, full of grace and mercy, that we're not going to hold back the proclamation of the good news of this new covenant that you've offered us. Forgiveness of our sin, completely free of charge, grace and mercy that's undeserved and paid for by you. I pray that we would turn and repent of the sinfulness that is at the core of who we are. As much as we want to be perfect, we know we can't be, and so I pray that you would forgive us for failing you, Lord. Help us to love you more than anything else in our lives. You are God. You are amazing. And so we thank you for this. I pray that you would not allow us to be blind to the salvation that you've offered us. But rather that you would reveal yourself to us clearly and that we would truly believe in you and not just believe things about you. I pray this in your name. Amen.